You know, Dr. Young asked me to speak on Mother's Day about a month ago. This is my fourth time being here at the church speaking in his absence. Each time it's been a holiday. New Year's fell on a Sunday, Fourth of July fell on two Sundays, and now Mother's Day, as always, on a Sunday. And I said, Dr. Young, there won't be many people in church. It's a holiday. He said, that's why I'm asking you to speak. Uh, <laughs> but we fooled him today. Look at this crowd. This is, this is really unbelievable. You know, some of my favorite verses about moms, you can find in Proverbs 31, 28, 29. If we can put those on the screen, do we have those there? If not, I'll read those. There we go. Read this. Her children arose and called her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. So with all those moms who stood and all those grandmoms who stood, you're all great, but your kids and your husband think you're the best. Is that pretty good? They really treasure you and they love you and they think you're the best. Earlier in Proverbs 25 through 27, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of the household and does not eat the bread of idleness. In other words, moms never stop. Can we get an amen on that? Amen. amen. They never stop. They're always running, running after their children, their grandchildren, their husbands, to help a neighbor. They never, ever stop. They give husbands advice, like getting dressed. Guys, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have you ever been dressed? You thought you looked good, you walked out, and your wife said, you're not wearing that today, are you? This is why this is my third tie this morning. She didn't like the first two. They never stop. And then I love this verse from Isaiah 66, 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. So think back a moment. Take a deep breath for all the adults and teenagers here. Think back maybe when you were five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10, a child. Remember that time that maybe you were injured, maybe you were sick, maybe someone at school said something mean to you, maybe you lost a pet. I remember crying for days when I lost my first dog. Uh, something happened, and where did you run to? You run to your mother's arms, and you can feel that hug today. I brought my mom's Bible she lived to 90, she's been gone eight years now, but that's my mom's Bible. I have my grandmother's Bible. Um, it was a little too fragile to bring. That's kind of falling apart from the 1800s. But you always knew when you went to your mother's arms that she would say, don't be afraid. It's okay. I'll love you forever. I'll never leave you. You just knew that, and it felt so good. It just felt so good. And you look at this verse, if we can put it right back up. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. So as great as a mom's love is, understand that when you run to Jesus, his love is even greater. Even greater. And he says, and I don't think I called for this scripture up uh, for today, so don't look for it, guys. But 31.6, I believe, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be terrified from them because your Lord God goes with you always and will never leave and never forsake you. So that love that we feel in our mother's embrace and her hug, that to this day, no matter how old you are, you know what I'm talking about. And even now, if you're fortunate enough to be a little older and your mom is still with you, you know that's a special love. But as special as that is, God's love is, is greater. So no one should ever be afraid. Ever be afraid when you walk with Jesus because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You can be strong. You can be courageous. That, that 
Some version of that verse, don't be afraid, do not fear, is in the Bible time and time and time again. In the history of Mother's Day, from a secular point for a moment, if you didn't know where it came from, there was a lady named Anne Jarvis. And before the Civil War in West Virginia, she started a Mother's Day club. And she really was trying to promote the wonder, wonderfulness of mothers. In 1873, a lady named Julia Ward tried to make it a holiday, but it didn't work. But about 30 years later, Ann Jarvis's daughter, Anna, petitioned the state of West Virginia to make Mother's Day a holiday, which they did in 1908. And in 1914, she went all the way to the White House and convinced President Woodrow Wilson to make Mother's Day a holiday. Honoring her mother, who died on the second Tuesday in May, that's why we celebrate on the second Tuesday, and here's an interesting piece of trivia. Her daughter never married and never had children. So the mother influenced the daughter to honor her, even though she never had children herself. So, mothers, we celebrate you today. History is always fascinating to me. I was here at church about six or eight weeks ago, and uh, I was speaking to a group of pastors from around the country, and Dr. Young was there, and afterwards he said, Dan, I mentioned this earlier, he said about a month ago, he said, would you come on Mother's Day? I will not be there, and I want you to share that speech you gave. So since I always follow God's word and Dr. Young's word, here I am. <laughs> Starts with a story that you're all familiar with. In the southern part of Texas, in the town of San Antonio, there's a fortress all in ruins that the weeds have overgrown. And you can look in vain for crosses. You'll never find a one, but sometimes between the setting and the rising of the sun, you'll hear a ghostly bugle as the men go marching by, as they answer, to the roll call in the sky. Colonel Travis and Davy Crockett, 180 more, Captain Dickinson and Jim Bowie, all the present and accounted for. You see, back in 1836, Houston said to Travis, get some volunteers and go fortify that Alamo. And the men came from Texas and from old Tennessee and they joined up with Travis to fight for the right to be free. There were Indians with squirrel guns and men with muzzle loaders and they stood together heel and toe to defend the Alamo. You may never see your loved ones, Travis told them that day. Those who want to, you can leave now. Those willing to fight to the death, you can stay. So in the sand, he drew a line with his army saber, and out of 185, not one soldier crossed the line. With his banners a-dancing in the dawn's golden light, 5,000 troops behind him, Santa Ana came prancing in the night. He sent a message to tell Travis to surrender, and Travis answered with a shell and a rousing rebel yell, and Santa Ana turned scarlet. Played the guelo, he roared, I will show them no quarter. Everyone will be put to the sword. Five days, six days, eight days, 10, Travis held and held again. He sent for replacements for his wounded and lame, but the troops with Fannin never came. And twice he charged in blue recall, but on that fatal third time, Santa Ana finally breached the wall and killed them one and all. Now the bugles are silent and there's rust on each sword and a small band of soldiers lies asleep in the arms of the Lord. In the southern part of Texas in the town of San Antonio, there's a statue of a cowboy as he rides there all alone. And he sees the cattle grazing for a century before Santa Ana's guns were blazing and the cannons used to roar. And his eyes turn sort of misty and his heart is all aglow. And he takes his hat off slowly to the men of Alamo, to the 13 days of glory to the men of Alamo. Now, we all know that story. Even if you're not from Texas, you know that story. If you didn't read it, you watched it. You know that story. It was about men making a decision to fight for independence, for liberty, and freedom. And that story goes on and on and on and on. It's what Israel is fighting for today, for independence, for liberty and freedom. It's what they're fighting for in Ukraine, the people of that country. People know that story all around the world. And some would say, but they lost the Alamo, Dan. 
Well, we've won a lot of wars as a nation. We've lost a few battles on the way to victory. That loss was not a loss because remember the Alamo became the cry for Sam Houston's troops in San Jacinto not long after that. History is an interesting thing. I talked to David McCullough, uh, who wrote great books about Jefferson Adams, the Wright brothers. If you've never read 1776, it's a wonderful book about George Washington's travails when he was run out of New York and really went most of the next six years without ever winning a battle, one or two here along the way. And we were talking afterwards at a book signing, and I mentioned something about history, because he is an historian, and he said, well, Dan, you don't understand, there's no such thing as history. And I said, well, explain that to me. He said, you see, Dan, history is diminished when we look back on it, because we look back on it through our eyes that they knew they were going to win. And that diminishes what they did. Because if you know you're going to win, it's not a big deal. Okay, we're gonna lose a battle here or there, we're gonna lose some men and women in battle, but we're going to win. No, he said they didn't know they were going to win. The founding fathers would have been hung had they lost. Their properties would have been taken. Their families put in jail. The king would have seen to that. They didn't know they were going to win. But based on what they knew, what they believed, what they thought was worth fighting for, they put it all on the line. They put it all on the line. Abraham Lincoln. Everyone assumes he knew the Union would be preserved. He didn't know. Notice he was pretty tall for president. Back then, pretty tall. He didn't know. He almost lost the war at Gettysburg. But he believed in preserving the nation, and based on the information he had, and based on what he believed, he risked everything. If you look at General Eisenhower on June 6th, D-Day, Talking to the troops, that was the day before the landings at Omaha Beach. Didn't know they'd win. And had Omaha Beach not been a successful landing, Hitler would have fought on another few years and he was on the verge of having his own atomic weapon, hydrogen bomb, atomic bomb. He was on the verge of having rockets. They were already flying uh, pretty basic jets in the world already and shooting some rockets. Eisenhower didn't know the outcome. Didn't know the outcome. But based on the information he had and what was at stake, he took the chance. Took a risk. And then let's fast forward to 9-11. I was in this church with Dr. Young in a men's prayer meeting the morning of 9-11 when the first tower was hit. And Ed Hendy was in the room, and he's a pilot, as you know, you know Ed. He, he came in and said, a plane's hit the tower. We all thought, most people thought, the first time you heard it was an accident. And then the second plane hit the tower, and we knew it wasn't an accident. It was a good place to be at church when that happened, as we all prayed, and I'm sure you prayed wherever you were. And I was active in my radio station back then, um, haven't been since I've been Lieutenant Governor for, and Senator for the last decade or more, but I was active and still in the air, and I thought, I've gotta to get to the radio station, I need to find out what's happening, people are gonna be turning on to hear the news. And before I could get to the station, down on Kirkwood and I-10, the Pentagon had been hit. We didn't know. He didn't know if we were going to prevail. But based on the information, based on what was at stake, based on being willing to take a risk and putting it all on the line for independence,
for liberty, for freedom. We were victorious at that moment. Through all of that, through all of that, these were people who made very tough decisions. So when we look back in history and tell our children about it, or talk amongst friends, just remember, they didn't know the outcome, but they were willing to fight for what they believe. And through it all, we know that Washington and Lincoln and Eisenhower and President Bush all went to prayer. Where are we today in this country? Where are we today in this world? I would challenge anyone, and I would say we are at great risk. Great risk. I visited a uh, Titan missile site uh, out in Tucson, Arizona about a month ago. I was there to see a friend of mine who had turned 86, and I've known him for 50 years, and I wanted to go say hi. And there's this little, if you're ever in Tucson, go by. It's a great 45-minute museum tour. And the missile still sits there in the silo. It's nine stories tall. They've removed a warhead, of course. It's the same missile that took, took us to the moon. It's just instead of pilots and astronauts on top, there's an atomic weapon on top. We had 1,600 of them back in 1962 to 1980 when this base was active. And in 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, Russia could launch a missile at us and hit any city, and we could launch a missile at them and hit any city in 30 minutes. The whole world could be lost in 30 minutes. The guide happened to be in his 70s. He was 19. He was actually commissioned there and told the interesting story of the great stress they had every day on the job. And he said, but we always had a certain comfort level that the Russians knew better. And we knew better, and we were the only two that had nuclear weapons. But now, a lot of people have nuclear weapons. It's a dangerous time in the world. It's a dangerous time in this country right now. There's a verse that you all know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and ask to be forgiven for their wicked ways and ask to heal their land, I will hear them from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. As a baby Christian, or maybe not even a Christian, there was a time in my life, decades ago, when I read that verse, if my people, and I thought my people, that was America. I said I was a baby Christian or maybe not a Christian. I thought that was America. My people, we are the nation blessed by God. Our whole constitution is based on the word of God. Of course we would be his people, but you know, and I now know, that's not true. All of the American people are not believers. They've not accepted Jesus Christ as our savior. In fact, there's a large percentage of people in this country today who want God out of the country. They want to break up the family. They want the church to go away. And they've been working on this for 40 years, 50 years. This didn't happen overnight. It started with prayer out of public school. It moved on to prayer out of the public place. Football coaches can't kneel and pray before a game, although he won his Supreme Court case. It's been a battle for 40 years. This nation, friends, is under attack from true Marxist socialists who do not believe in God. They believe in government. And the way they take over a country is to get rid of the family and rid of God and make government everyone's family and everyone's God. And that's where we are. And like George Washington and like Lincoln and like Eisenhower and like President Bush and so many other men and women through history have put it all on the line because they didn't want to lose this great country that we've lived in. We're now there. It's on us. 
I don't know who's going to win the November election. I don't know when the woke culture is going to end. I don't know when the border is going to get secured. I don't know when our military is going to be strong again. I don't know when we're going to keep killers and murderers and rapists in jail in Harris County. I don't know. But I know if we, as Christians, my people, don't stand and fight, we lose. We lose. We lose. It's not about politics. It's not about party affiliation. At that speech, when I was speaking to those other pastors, there was another pastor who stood up for North Carolina and he talked for a little bit. And he said, you know, we had this idea in North Carolina, it was a nonpartisan election, no R's or D's, but they ran a God's ticket. A God's ticket. What was on the ticket? That we believe in God, we believe in Jesus as our Savior, we believe that our country should be strong and have a secure border, we believe in law and order, we believe in parents should have the choice to send their child to be educated in the school that they want, we believe in life, we believe a man and a woman are a man and a woman, that ticket that would win votes from everybody. That ticket would win votes from everybody. So what does the Bible say about history? First of all, it's Mother's Day. What does it say about women? There are two books in the Bible, of course, Esther and Ruth. Esther, what a story that is. Great story. An orphan to a queen. She saved Israel. Ruth, about loyalty, devotion, and love. Great story. Women always played, even though a lot of the biblical figures are men, women always played significant roles in the Bible's history. I remember when I was a kid, someone said to me, Dan, do you know what the Bible's all about? I said, it's God's word. He said, yes. Do you know what Bible stands for? I said, no. He said, basic information before leaving earth. I've never forgotten that. <laughs> if you go through the Bible, and I wrote a book, Ben and I were talking before I came out. Uh, I can't believe it's been 22 years ago I wrote this book called The Second Most Important Book You'll Ever Read, A Challenge to Read the Most Important Book, The Bible. I've never been to seminary. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a preacher. Although when I'm out of office, this is what I like to do part-time, traveling around the state or the country, because it's what's most important to me. But when you look at the Bible, it's an instruction guide for life. It's a tool for teaching. It's the history of the world. Most importantly, it's about forgiveness and love and salvation knowing that you have hope, the expected hope, that you will be in heaven. Not like a hope, like a help I hit the lottery, like it's a promise. Most important book, that's why I wrote my book. This is the most important book ever written. And women played important roles. When Jesus' life was beginning, it was Elizabeth carrying her baby. And when Mary walked in pregnant with Jesus, her baby left for joy, the minute Jesus walked in the room. Throughout the Bible, stories in the New Testament where Jesus interacted with women in powerful ways, in touching ways, in loving ways. At the crucifixion, many women were there. And who was the first to discover the empty tomb and hear the voice of Jesus and recognize the voice after resurrection? It was Mary. So women have always played an important part in the Bible. And I think, guys, we're lucky because the Lord has blessed women with talents that we don't have. And we need them. They make us feel worthwhile. They make us 
have a reason to go to work and support our families. They make us have this feeling that we'll do anything to protect our family. And remember, back to Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts you, so will I. There's something else about history. Um, when I wrote the book 20 years ago, um, I, look, I remembered back when I was going through my early days of Bible reading and being a Christian, trying to answer questions, trying to answer doubts. And one of the things I kept coming back to was Jerusalem. Always to Jerusalem. You know, the Bible could have, could have set any one city aside and said the whole world is going to always be in turmoil over Jerusalem. I mean, there were lots of countries back then. There were lots of cities. Most of them have all disappeared. The sands have erased the map lines. So how is it that a Bible of 66 books in the Old and New Testament talks about one city, one city, thousands of years ago, and here we are again today. People say, well, is this the end times? Don't know, is it the beginning? Near the end, don't know. I'm not, I'm not a student to teach on that. But I know this, that every time Israel has been a nation, it's been attacked. You can name all the different people that attacked them. The Philistines, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians. They've been attacked and destroyed. And why? Because God says in the Bible, he has a special plan for Israel. A special plan. And Satan doesn't want that special plan to come to fruition. So he keeps destroying Israel, and Israel keeps rising up. So that little bit of history, when we talk about history today in this nation, think about the history of the Bible. Think about the history of the Bible. I don't know, as I said, what November brings or next year. I don't know when the woke culture ends and people wake up. I don't know the future, but I know if Christians don't stand and fight as they have through time, we lose. Public polls show that 52% of the people in the country say they go to church every week. 52%. Of those, only half are registered to vote. And of the half who are, only half vote. So why are we losing to the ungodly left, Marxist socialists who want to take over our country and take every right you have, including your religious rights away? Because only one out of four people who profess Christ, my people, only one out of every four vote. We just get it to two, we own the world. We get it to three, we control everything. So it's on your watch. We don't know what the people 30 or 40 years from now are gonna say about us. Hopefully, Christians will arise and fight for their country and fight for their families and fight for their beliefs and fight for the kingdom of God. Hopefully we will. That's what we must do. And will they say 30 years from now, of course they knew they would prevail. Of course they knew they were going to win back 30 years in 2024. Of course they knew, because they knew they had God on their side and they stood and fought. They had God on their side and they knew they could not lose. I'll close this with uh, Proverbs 22.6 for Mother's Day. Train them as children how they should go. And when they are older, they will not depart from that path. Moms, you give all of us a purpose. You teach us God's will for our life. You show us the path. And moms and grandmoms, we need you more than ever. And dads, we need you too.